Hey everybody, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and today we're looking at GDevelop 5. Now, if you've been following this channel for any particular period of time, you probably remember I already looked at GDevelop earlier, the GDevelop 4. It's an open source project. Um, it's a 2D game engine with a visual programming interface, kind of engine that you don't need to know how to program to use. Kind of competes with the likes of Construct, Stencil, a um, little bit of Game Maker in there, those kind of projects. It's kind of trying to accomplish the same basic thing. Um, and when I looked at it, uh, like I said, about a year back, it was yeah June, uh, I, I was quite impressed with it, but there was also some, you know, rough spots, I'd say. The usability could use a little bit of cleanup. It wasn't as intuitive as I'd like to see, but I gotta say, wow, what a difference a year can make. So that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at GDevelop. Now, if you want to check out GDevelop, you can actually go straight to their website, and of course, all these links down below, as usual. Um, but you can try it online directly in their browser. A lot of the, what you're coding here is generating JavaScript-based games behind the scenes. It's kind of transparent or hidden to you. Um, but they've also got the editor can run completely in a browser. Kind of an impressive development. But what really gets me with this editor is how much easier it is to use. This is a great starting point for game development. I'm actually thinking about doing a dev game tutorial series on this guy. Let me know if you're interested in seeing more or not. But first off, let's keep going and looking at what GDevelop has to offer. And I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because I've already done that one closer look. And a lot of it is still relevant. It's most of what we're going to look at today is the usability improvements that have come in the end in the editor and in the engine so you can see what you're getting into here now you said it is open source the source code is up on github in terms of the licensing it's a bit confusing the back end so the core libraries the native and html5 game engines the ide um, and all the extensions are mit licensed uh, the new ide that's confusing the ide in the ide folder is licensed gpl v3 so it seems like there might be two ides or a legacy ide possibly but most of the code here is under the mit license mit license is very liberal in use gpl is a little bit more restrictive uh, basically you can't modify the source without also releasing your own modifications to that source all right, about enough about the details, let's jump in. Now, this is what happens when you download it. You download it, uh, it's available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. The installer is about 50 megs on Windows, and you just double click it and it opens up here. Come on in and do a create a new project. Now, the cool thing is, if you're coming at this from the perspective of a brand new developer, uh, we've got a couple of straight up prototypes to go with. Very cool work there. So you've got a platformer or a space shooter, or you can just create a straight out empty game. And also go into the examples and you see there's a ton of examples about learning various different things you can see here they're, they're pulling them all from online um, and then we've also got a number of tutorials to go with so you've got uh, making a platform game tutorial from scratch making a simple tanks shooter game from scratch hey i like their naming there uh, so we'll head on back here we're just going to do a simple out space shooter so we'll click that it's going to create a project for us and you can immediately see it in action here is your space shooter here is an instance of your ship you select it you see the properties of the ship you can apply variables to an actual instance now an instance is a one version or a running version so you see here we've got rock so we have, have a palette of options we can create over here so we could create an, a rock in rock mode like that so each time I drop and create a rock I'm creating a new instance of it we select the rock I created and you'll see over here we could set variables for that particular instance um, but a very streamlined event here then we get into the coding so uh, the the coding is done via event sheets there are both global events and local events to the scenes a scene is basically like a game level or a screen uh, in this particular case you can see top level categories so we've got in game and game over and then in game we have a bunch of other criteria so you see here uh, variable pause is not so as long as the game isn't paused all the code underneath will execute and you see it's broken down into conditions these have the conditions of nothing so this code will automatically run so it hides the game over logic and it does an update to the time on the, the game so you see here initialization so uh, it's triggered by the event at the beginning of the scene. We'll look at this all in a second. I'll create a very, very, very simple game in just one second. And then we've got logic here for the player. So if the life is, if the player is still alive, timers, if a certain amount of time has elapsed since the last time it ran through this. So you can think of this whole flow chart as basically the game event loop. So here, over here are the conditions or the multiple conditions. 
And then over here is the actions to go ahead and perform. It's a lot easier to actually illustrate how to do this you know, from starting from scratch. So we'll do that in a second. And then if you want to run your game, you can click here to play it. We'll do that. Here is a preview of our game in action. Like so. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it is a browser-based game, so you can bring up the, the console window, etc., and expect into your game. Um, we have uh, advanced preview options, brings up the developer networking previews, etc. Uh, this is how you would create a new event, like this guy right here. Uh, this is how you would add a comment to the event. If you've created a new event, you can create a sub-event this way, and you can add a new event this way. So this is your basically all that is required from the programming side of things. It's it's amazingly clean and straightforward, and that's the whole idea behind this stuff because you are you know trying to gear this towards people with no prior programming experience, and it is it, it succeeds at it to be honest. A lot of times these visual programming languages just seem like they're more work, or you'd just be better off scripting. And don't get me wrong, if you're an experienced programmer, you would probably be more efficient doing this particular logic in code most of the time. Uh, so it's not a matter of programmer productivity really, but when you're just learning or if you don't automatically know you know what script to type, this will beat it every single time because this is kind of self-documenting as we'll see in a second. So over here you can see a kind of a project overview of our game Space Shooter. So we've got our settings available right here. These are things like your resolution, your name, uh, orientation to display. And again, this can target uh, mobile builds such as Android. Um, we can set global variables here, icons, resources in our game. So this is all of the various different assets that are used, the spaceship, the rocks, and the, the all that kind of stuff. New external events, uh, some kind of global logic to your game. And then the other window we've got over here is just basically this guy, which says, okay, make me a game. And so when you're ready and want to build it, uh, you can publish out to Android currently and iOS coming soon. Now, this Android publish is sort of where the game engine is commercialized. Uh, right now, you get a limited number. It's built on their servers. You can do, I think, two builds a day. Otherwise, there's a subscription on the back end available, mostly to help support this open source project so that you're not limited from doing anything. You do not need to do a subscription unless you're doing a lot of compilations. Uh, and then you see you can build here for Facebook, Instant Games, Web, Mac OS, uh, Windows, and Linux. Uh, you can build to a local folder, uh, manually build for these different projects. So these are done locally as opposed to using their server for doing so. And if you click this, one more shows up, which is a build for Cocos 2D JS, which is Cocos 2D is another framework. Basically, I think it just spits out code that you can then compile using their workflow. So that is kind of GDevelop in a nutshell. Let's look at a really, really simple, um, uh, really simple uh, uh, game. Uh, I, game is probably overselling what we're about to do, but I'm going to create a new project from scratch. We're going to pick empty instead. So here you see we're in our uh, empty game. So we can set it over here. We come in here and call it uh, Super Awesome Fun. You can set your resolution there accordingly. Put your name in here, Bob Dole, and apply. So there we've got global properties of our game. If we wanted to bring in some resources or navigate our resources, we could do so here. But what instead I am going to do is add a scene. So this is the main scene of our game. I will rename this and I will call it main scene of our game. All right, so now we've got a scene and we can get into the editor. Now, one thing I really wish they would change, they've really streamlined the usability 100%. This shouldn't be a pop-out. This is too important and it obscures stuff. So when this is here, you don't see the other options for like properties or things for building. I wish this was a slide out. So it pushed the UI over. This should not be over top. Uh, it's the only real feedback I give to the developers here. I would highly suggest making that so that that actually integrates like an inbuilt uh, panel like what we see here. So here is our resource for building our game. Let's go ahead and add an object to our game. So here are your basic building blocks for building a 2D game. Pretty straightforward stuff. So you see tiled sprites for basically if you've got a tiled map, you want to build it out of Lego blocks. Basically, you can use tiled maps. You can bring in particle systems, nine patch. Nine patch is a custom kind of version of sprite where you've got the corners so that it can scroll out uh, infinitely and still look smooth at any resolution, generally used for UI layers. Uh, text entry object, shape painter, and um, add integration directly. Most of what you're going to build is sprites. So we're going to build a new sprite. We'll call this my bouncy ball. All right. Uh, here you see you can create hitboxes or collision layers for it. Um, 
We can add behaviors to it. But what I am going to do is take my bouncy ball and add an animation to it. And one of the very cool things since the 4.0 release is they have actually integrated Pixel uh, directly into it. This is a uh, texture-based editor or an image editor that is built directly into uh, the thing. So we're 32 by 32. I'll zoom out there. And all I'm going to do is create a ball. That's really awful. Now what I'm going to do is create a new frame. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to delete that frame. And I'm going to duplicate this frame. Then we're going to get out our eraser tool. Like so let's erase all this stuff. Let's make that bigger. And so... Yoink. And then we'll go back to draw. Oh, I want to go back to single pixel. And make that a little bit smaller. And then we'll duplicate. Oops. Oh, is there a control Z? Ah, good, there is. All right. And now we'll duplicate that guy. And then once again, go into eraser. Ah, let's get rid of all this guy at the top here. So obviously, if you were making a real game, you could use this to create your frame by frame sprite animation. There's actually kind of cool tools built in here. There's a lot of stuff I'm not even going to touch on here. But it is a full form integrated editor. And there is our animation. You can see it in action there. We can drop the frames per second down there so it looks a little bit better. It's not the, the loveliest animation you ever saw, but hey, it works for me. Now we're going to call this guy Bouncy. All right, so Bouncy is done. Save that out to G-Develop, and there you go. So we can tell it, okay, now loop this animation over and over again. I think it takes the, um, the frame rate I set earlier. So now we go ahead and create it. So we now have an instance of my Bouncy Ball we can use in our scene. Go ahead and create an instance of it, and we can play our scene like so. And there you go. There is our bouncy ball. Bouncy in very slow motion. And now let's look at actually adding some game logic to an entity. So we can come back here. We'll do it at the scene level. So um, scene. There are no events here. Events are composed on conditions act. Add your first event using the button at the top of the toolbar. So we're now in event mode. I don't know why it's truncating off. It should actually sit. Oh, because I've used such a long name. Don't use such a long name. You'll see at the end here, it'll say event. Coincidentally, developers, I'd also recommend um, moving the bit that you put at the end to the beginning so people can see that this is the event sheet. Otherwise, these two objects are now indistinguishable. But what we now need to do is go ahead and add our event sheet here. And this is your programming interface. So what I'm going to do is a, I could do a no condition and basically just do an action. So what we could do right here is go here and go to common actions, movement, apply movement to all objects, and this is gonna move everything. Um, and right, apply movement to all objects, we'll click OK. Actually, I don't wanna do that, that's a bad one. All right, let's delete that. So you right click and get rid of it like this. So let's do it, we'll start out straight up with a condition. So now what I'm gonna do is I wanna do keyboard stuff. Now this is really impressive is, uh, especially if you're a new user, you got no idea where you wanna be. Like this gets annoying. There's all these different categories for um, all your actions. These are the conditions that can cause an event to fire or not fire. So you can come here, I come in here and check for uh, behavior, if a behavior was activated, uh, behaviors, remember we saw earlier when I was creating this object that we could define behaviors for it. Um, we come in here for sprite, if it collided with something, or uh, mouse or touch, if that happens. So there are all these different things here, and there, as you can see, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, you've got inventory stuff here, platform specific logic, like if I'm falling, or if I'm on a ladder, or if I'm on a floor. So you don't necessarily know what you want to do here. So what I'm going to look for is the key press. So I'm just going to type key. And then you see it, it narrows or filters down the entire list of um, actions that are available to me. So there we go. Okay, there is key pressed. So if this key is pressed, and then we come here, and now I can filter down to find the key I want. Now, another feedback I would give, say I want to do right arrow. Oh, no, it does filter. Never mind, I'm mixing it up with another engine. So there we go, right. So if I have the right key is pressed, now of course we can invert this logic and say if the right key is not pressed, but we'll go ahead with right key pressed. And then over here, we add our action of what to do. And what we will do is um, position. So see here, we got X position of an object. And we go in here, we pick our objects. We've got my mouncy ball, uh, modify. So we can see here, we've got the different options. We can just straight up set it to a value or we can add values to it like so. And the amount to add. And now we can do this a bit of logic. So if we want to do it based off like the frame rate, et cetera, we can come in here and do a formula and we can filter down by this. So you say time, elapsed time since last. Um, so that, we'll do that way. So now what we're gonna do 
to say 200 times delta time. So that will give us 200 pixels ultimately over uh, one second or whatever the millisecond value is. I assume that works. Now we're gonna go ahead and run our script. So there is our bouncy ball. I press the right arrow and we move at a frame rate of 200 pixels per second. Pretty clean, pretty straightforward. And it's actually pretty amazing the usability that they've polished into this. this this is just so easy to understand. Now do keep in mind, these actions are completely the opposite of the other ones. So um, the other ones were, so the left-hand side over here is your, your conditions, your right-hand side is actions. So these are different values. These are things that, uh, think of one as like, these are verbs. These are things that actually cause things to happen in the world. Um, whereas all of these are conditionals, basically that determine if the stuff on the right is going to happen. Now you notice here, I've got one action. Now I could go ahead and add another action as well. Um, here, we'll stick to movement. Uh, so let's do Y axis. So, um, move Y. All right, Y is giving me too many things. But I'll scroll down and find it. X position of an object, Y position of an object. So you'll see here, when the one condition is true, and we'll subtract one. All right, so we're good to go. So you see here, I have one condition if the right arrow is keyed, but I have two actions applied to it. And we go ahead and run it, and now you'll see we also move up as we move. So that's how this works. You can add as many, um, as many uh, responses or actions to a particular condition. And we can also add multiple conditions. So I could say uh, mouse, mouse button down, mouse button pressed or held, button left. Okay, so now what you've got here is I need to have the right key pressed and the left mouse button down for the movement to work. So you can have multiple conditions as well. And it's it's that straightforward. It's very um, simple and easy to navigate. I, I'm uh, astonishingly impressed with uh, what they've managed to do here. There are just a little bit of usability things I would tweak, but otherwise this is just amazingly easy to understand. This is might be one of my recommendations for beginners to start with. This is one of the easiest to use 2D game engines I've ever encountered. And it's amazing how much of the cruft they've cleaned out from the earlier release and how much they've streamlined it. This is just dead simple to use. So I firmly recommend it. If you are looking to start off in 2D game development and you can't figure out where to go, this is a great choice. Now, another cool thing that I've never actually showcased, if you want to transition a little bit further, we come back here, we can add an action. There's also, all right, what do I call it? Code. Okay, I don't know how to get to it immediately, but you can also have it so that one of your actions is just a straight out call JavaScript code. Behind the scenes, as you saw when we used a formula um, earlier on, so when, when in this guy, let's go ahead and edit this action. So let's, come on. How do I edit? There we go. Uh, when I brought up this form editor and we came, eh, I get back here. See how it, it just inserted this code call? Well, that's calling to that underlying code engine that be back there. There is a JavaScript powered game engine behind it and you have full access to it. So you can actually have your, um, it, it, you know, as you get more advanced in what you're doing, you can have these actions call straight out JavaScript code that you provide. So it does give you that nice transition to, okay, I wanna do more programming and less visual that option in migration path is there. So I think this is an excellent beginner's tool. I'm not gonna, again, I'm gonna leave it at about there. I just wanted to introduce it to you, show you how usable it is, especially if you've probably used GDevelop in the past. You'll probably be as astonished as I am just how much cleaner the, the experience is and how much more user-friendly it is. They've, they've nailed it. And I think of all of the ones that are out there that I've played with, of um, Construct, Stencil, Game Maker, uh, those kind of tools, I think this is the easiest one. Uh, so uh, kudos to the GDevelop team. They've done an excellent job. Now, I haven't really pushed it to its limits. So I don't know where your performance lim limits start to kind of kick in. But as you saw, there were an absolute ton of demos available to get you started with. So you can play through that and see if you can find a game that is of the scope of what you're trying to create. You're not going to be creating the next, you know, 
uh, Quake Killer or anything. And this obviously this is a 2D game engine focused on usability. So you know you might pay some performance costs as a result. But if you are just starting out, you shouldn't be overly concerned about performance in the first place, anyways. So that is GDevelop Five again. All the links will be down below. Are you a GDevelop user? If so, look, give me your feedback on what you think of it. Uh, did you use an earlier version of GDevelop and something turned you off? Maybe it's fixed now. All the same, let me know. Comments down below. Talk to you all later. Goodbye.